Good afternoon and welcome to the 8th session of the 53rd Phoenix Annual Conference. The theme of this session is reshaping business education in the face of disruption, addressing challenges and seizing opportunities. May I now call on the MC for this afternoon session. He is the Vice President for Investor Relations at Finma Corporation, Mr. Edmund Allen Kuahiansen. Good afternoon, JPhoenix community, Phoenix members, friends from partner business organizations, and to our esteemed guest speakers. Entitled Reshaping Business Education in the Face of Disruptions, Adjusting Challenges and Seizing Opportunities, this webinar is part of the week-long 53rd Annual Phoenix Conference and is presented by the Junior Phoenix Committee. I am EJ Koyansen, your host for today's webinar. If you have any questions during today's session for our speakers, you can type them into the Q&A box. Student attendees of today's session are also eligible for our raffle prizes today. So for our students, please stay until the end of the session as we have some very exciting raffle prizes, including a laptop, tablets, and cell phone load. Only those who log in not later than 4 p.m. will be qualified for the raffle. Virtual presence is required. Before we formally start, may I call on our very own liaison trustee, Mr. Benito Benny Sullivan III, for the invocation. Thank you, EJ. Let's put ourselves in the presence of our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us, gathering all of us here today in this special J Phoenix session. May you bestow your guidance and blessings to our speakers as they share with us, and especially the youth, their thoughts and insights on how to turn the challenges of the disruptions of today into opportunities towards achieving excellence in business education tomorrow and in the future. You, dear Lord, are our breath who will help us inhale the new and exhale the old. As we embark on to relearning how to learn, give us the gift of discernment as we live and reimagine our lives amidst this new normal. Enlighten and challenge everyone here this afternoon to keep an open mind as we listen to the wisdom of our speakers. Let us humble ourselves, knowing that you will give us the grace and the strength to overcome whatever obstacles we may face due to this pandemic. Heavenly Father, you are our rock and our salvation. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Benny. Now may I call on Junior Phoenix Chairperson, Dr. Mildred Bitangkol, for her welcoming remarks. Thank you, AJ. Good afternoon, everyone. To our Phoenix Chairman of Phoenix Research and Development Foundation, Jose Jerome Jeng Pasqual III, Junior Phoenix Trustee Benito Benny Sullivan III, our distinguished Phoenix Board Trustees, Board of Trustees, and of course, to our Phoenix Organizing Committee 2021, EJ Jansen, Tony Boy, Conchaco, John Balsi, to Mike Guarin, our Legion Director and 2021 Phoenix for the Phoenix 2121 Phoenix Week. For our conference guest speakers, the President and CEO of FINMA Education Holdings Incorporated, Dr. Chito Salazar, the Executive Director of AIM Rosalino Navarro Policy Center for Com Competitiveness, Dr. Jamil Francisco. Phoenix Executive Director, Mark Beluan, and of course to our hardworking tech team. Junior Phoenix and Phoenix participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 2021st Phoenix Conference Session 8 entitled Reshaping Business Education in the Face of Disruptions, Addressing Challenges and Existing Opportunities. Today, 
brings into fruition all that we dream to do. Plan and making into the vibrant reality of our Phoenix and Junior Phoenix Conference. Whatever significant learning and sparks of inspiration each of us will accomplish today has a strong reference from the triumphs and failures of the past and what we better or great things we want to happen in the near and distant future. In the next, in the next weeks, months, or even years from now, we look back to today because we will have planted more seeds of influential pivotal actions for transformation and nurture that which we planted and our other previous and ongoing activities in Junior Phoenix. This is a never ending journey and it comes with unwavering commitments in our lifetime. This among others is an investment on our youth through J Phoenix who will carry the torch of our ideals and goals in Phoenix that will shape them slowly, but surely into human capital when the right and right time comes. As leaders of Phoenix, we continue to contribute largely to reshaping the way we do things in business, education, and industry directions. Perhaps even inspire communities to innovate using technology more to hasten economic recovery and people empowerment, especially our youth. In the words of Albert Einstein, education is what remains after one has forgotten everything learned in school. May we inculcate more in the, in the young, brilliant minds in our academic institutions as well as our own families, the nurture imagination and intuition because they're the wellspring of creativity and creation. And that we begin with reshaping our own paradigms to show the young what, we, where, when, why, and how transformation is walked more than talked. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and have a pleasant day ahead. Back to you, MC, uh, AJ. Thank you, Dr. Mildred, for that inspiring message. Before we proceed to the main event, allow me to introduce our speakers in reverse order. Our second speaker is Dr. Jamil Paolo S. Francisco. Dr. Francisco is an economics associate professor at the Asian Institute of Management. He is also the executive director of AIM Rizalino S. Navarro Policy Center for Competitiveness and serves as interim school head of the Stephen Suele Graduate School of Development Management. Dr. Francisco is co-author of the book, ASEAN Champions, Emerging Stalwarts of Regional Integration, published by Cambridge University Press. It studied the experiences and strategies of 58 top performing companies in the region that have experienced sustained success in their local markets and have the potential of shaping the future. He obtained both his doctor's and master's degree in economics from the Ateneo de Manila University. Our first speaker is Dr. Chito B. Salazar. Dr. Salazar is the president and CEO of Finma Education Holdings, a fast growing network of schools in Southeast Asia that serves students in the low and mid-income markets. Guided by its mission of making lives better through education, Finma Education owns and manages nine schools in the Philippines and two schools in Indonesia. Concurrently, Dr. Salazar is Chief Operations Officer of FINMA, President and Co-Founder of Philippine Business for Education. He also serves as a board member of several organizations. Dr. Salazar has a doctor's degree in international relations from the School of International Service at the American University in Washington, DC, and a master's in international political economy and development from Fordham University in New York. Let us welcome Dr. Chita Salazar. Thank you, EJ. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon. Magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. I'd like to also thank all of the officers and executives of Phoenix uh, for 
giving this opportunity to us to share our thoughts on the future of business education and based on our experiences. Magandang hapon din po sa lahat mga estudyante na narito ngayon. I will, I will, I realized that most of the members of the audience really are uh, our students. I will actually re, re, reposition my, my discussion more towards the students. So let me uh, go to the next slide. I, I realize I only have 15 minutes, so I will try to be as concise as possible and leave it to questions. You know, there's so many talks nowadays. Napakarami po na mga discussion tungkol sa meron magpagbabago nangyayari dahil sa pandemia. Obviously, obviously uh, there have been many big changes. But in my opinion, my first proposition of my talk today is that it has hastened changes that were actually taking place even before. So marami sa mga pagbabagong pag-uusapan natin ngayon, matagal na yan nangyayari. Kahit bagong bago pa sa pandemia, nagsimula na yung mga pagbabago na yan. So that we, we, we need, these are not necessarily new, it just sped things up or created the urgency for them to happen more now. The second one, ito, medyo hihingin ko to sa mga sadyante, all of us here, uh, you know, we all, most of us study in very traditional colleges and universities. I need to ask you to suspend your own experiences because I will be a little bit radical in my discussions on education. Tsaka na-realize ko pa nga na uh, many of the students are already within the system that I actually want to uh, revise or change or challenge. No? Kasi uh, my second point is these changes which have begun even before the pandemic, it's not about lifelong learning or basic education or higher education or technical education. It's about reconceptualizing even the very way we learn and whether these this, uh, categories of higher basic technical are even necessary or important. And my last, my last uh, proposition, which is very uh, appropriate for this, smart, for this uh, discussion, is the world of work and the world of learning has really radically changed and we should actually accept the change. Dati kasi ang, ang, in the tradition, especially in the Philippines, this is the way our lives are set. We start out in, uh, uh, we're, we're born, we go to preschool, we go to prep, we go to grade one by the age of six, we finish grade 10, you go to junior high school for four years, then senior high school for two years, then four years, four years of, uh, four years of college, two years of work, MBA, and then back to work. Parang the categories are very strict and very stagnant, very lateralized and very uh, linear. But actually in this world today, and I will explain why, we need to rethink this whole process of learning. Uh, it, it, it isn't as linear as it should be anymore. And I will explain uh, uh, why. Uh, you know, the other day, as a matter of fact, uh, as a way to summarize, I'm going to say, I was talking to my sister-in-law and she asked me, her, her son is about to graduate from senior high school and was asking me, ano bang kurso ang dapat kunin ng anak niya? Ano ba yung magagandang trabaho? That, that, this whole concept of ano yung magagandang trabaho is something so part of my generation. I'm a late, uh, late, Early, I'm sorry, I'm an early Gen Xer. So 19, I was, I came into my uh, uh, better years in the 1980s. Uh, that kind of question that you take college primarily to pre prepare for a specific career is not the right question to ask anymore. <laughs> uh, especially since our millennials change their careers 10 to 12 times in their lifetime. So uh, I, I gave different kinds of advice. I actually told my, my sister-in-law, wag no problemahin yung, yung kukuri niya sa college. He, he or she, well, in this case, it was a he, you can take anything uh, unless you are really targeted for a specific career like uh, medicine or engineering or nursing. But otherwise, especially in the field of business, you can take almost anything to prepare you for the world of business. And I'm sorry if that's a little bit radical or shocking, but let me go to my next slide, no? uh, which is the way I want to approach this meeting. This is one of my favorite quotations of all time. It's from an internet guru, which I got in the 19, in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s. So this was still the early years of the internet, where she said, faith is a central process of innovation. A crucial law of intellectual cre creativity is that belief comes before knowledge. I think this is really interesting. Belief comes before knowledge. The logic of creativity is leap before you look because you cannot see things, anything new from an old place. The old rule of look before you leap provided only refinements of old imagination, of old ideas. Imagination, intuition, and hypothesis are the first steps of technical creation. What this basically means, especially now uh, in this time, we cannot, we cannot predict any type of incremental change if you're looking before you leap between, uh, caused by the pandemic are only incremental changes. Uh, we need to actually be willing to leap before we look. 
because we're not sure what the future will really, really be like. So I hope you withhold a little bit your all ideas about education and learning, et cetera, and withhold suspension as I go through my discussion. So next slide. There are many drivers of change of why we need to reconceptualize education, especially business education in this day and age. And I will talk about a few because I don't have a lot of time and just highlight just a few, but these are the drivers of change I see. Number one are the kind of jobs out there. There's an old saying, and this saying has been around for decades, that the jobs in the next four to five years that you will enter, kayo mga mga graduate, those of you who graduate in four to five years, the jobs you will be applying for don't even exist yet today. Uh, a few years ago, siguro mga 2015, 2012, uh, 2015, 2014, the big job back then was analytics. Uh, alam mo, do, nung panahon namin, uh, in the 1980s, and even I think to the 1990s, analytics was not a big thing. But suddenly, in 2015, it was a big thing. So that causes, if you don't know the kind of jobs you'll be applying for, how do you prepare? Is the big question. No? Second, uh, driver of change, is youth unemployment and skills mismatch. This has always been a big problem. Uh, industry always complains that there's a mismatch between the kind of graduates we have and the kind of uh, jobs industry needs. We also need to adjust the way we learn. Kung, kung ayusin natin to, ang ibig po sabihin nito, yung mga nagtatapos sa kolehiyo, according to industry, hindi po sila sang ayon, hindi, hindi sila tapat sa kailangan nila sa trabaho. So we need to adjust the way we, we, we teach and work with industry in order to bridge this mismatch. The next point is, uh, next, education itself has changed. The way we do education, I'll talk about this a little bit. Actually, I think this is what I will discuss even more. Next, uh, next point, uh, the changing nature of work. I'll also talk about this. I won't talk about it now. And last but not the least, is our ever-changing market. The students, the people entering our workforce are very different from the people during my time. Uh, during my time, people stayed in one company for 30 years, and that's the ambition. Uh, you would create incentives to stay for 30 years. Aho, what, I, what I'm trying to challenge my own company to do is, how do we create incentive systems to get these young millennials to commit three to five years of, of their lives with us? And then okay lang if they leave. Because the days are gone where you hope that you, know, you go for 30 years. And not just that, your children will apply to the same company. Actually, if, my guess is, uh, my dear students, if you talk to your teachers, many of them are like that. Kaga graduate sa kolehiyo, pumasok sa school, at nagturo na hanggang, hanggang uh, magret magretiro. So let me just emphasize two of these, two of these uh, changes. The first one is the changing nature of work. The, the, next slide, please. Our work environment has changed radic rad radically. Uh, dati rate organizations were flat. I am sorry, were vertical, very hierarchical, credential oriented. There was a division of labor, but all this has changed. It's now changed to teams, project teams. As I mentioned, employees aren't staying uh, very long. Communications is very important, uh, and the teams work across different disciplines. So, hindi katulad na dati, you you you're an accountant. You stay in the accounting office, in the finance office, and that's where you are. Now, our finance people have to work with the marketing people, have to work with, with different groups, uh, and that's the challenge. And, and in many of our schools, that isn't part of our training. Accountants are trained to finish accounting, to pass the board. Uh, in any of the board, in the board exam, issues of communications, collaboration, teamwork, cross-cultural cross -cultural management, none of these things are tested in the accounting board. But... All of these things are important today to succeed in the corporate world. So, dahil po nagbago ang sitwasyon sa mga kompanya, kailangan din magbago po ang ating curriculum at ating edukasyon. Uh, next slide. Isa pa itong nangyayari. Alam niyo po, nagbago na po ang edukasyon sa buong mundo, pero hindi pa rin nagbabago ang sistema ng edukasyon ng Pilipinas. This is interesting. The illiterate of the 21st century, this is from Toffler, will not, will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Dati dati ang priority, tatlong hours nga, nung panahon ko ulit, nung panahon ko, tatlong hours ang pinakimportante. Ito nakakatawa, hindi mali pa yung spelling kasi tatlong hours. Reading, writing, at saka arithmetic. Nakakatawa, no? Kasi dyan pa lang, mali na yung spelling, but we called it the three hours, no? Dati yan ang priority. How well do you know math? How well do you know English? How well do you know uh, all of these things? But now, the bigger priority is learn, unlearn, and relearn. Because knowledge is just changing so fast. Let me just give one, one, one easy example. Uh, well, I'll discuss this later on. So given that knowledge is changing so fast, the careers you're going to, you're going to be part of 
are, are also going to be different. How do you prepare? So the way to prepare yourself is really to learn how to learn and how to unlearn and then learn again. That really should be the priority of, of education. Do you need to know every single, do you need to memorize every single finance investment ratio today? when actually all of this is accessible on your phone, on Google, uh, right away, uh, and can calculate it for you, by the way. <laughs> Parang that's not as important as it used to be when I had to memorize all the finance ratios. No? So, nagpapago talaga ang edukasyon at nagagawago ang pangangailangan ng, ng, ng mundo. No? So, how do, we, how do we adjust? What should business education or education be like today? Let me show, uh, let, next slide, please. What should learning be? First, learning must be willing to change the rules. And I'll discuss this a little bit more. Second, I think very important, we must focus on general competencies. And I'm telling this to business. Business education must focus less on specific competencies of business. Ito yung mga tipong finance, marketing, production, operations, uh, human resources, and more on the general competencies. And I will list down what the general competencies are. Uh, last but not the least, we must blur the lines between business and education. So these are more important, and I will explain why these uh, are a result of the drivers of change. So, una, change the rules. Hindi nyo pa naisip, ito lang, ipaborito kong tanong, uh, you can just click everything, please. Alam nyo, I'm an educator at heart, although that's not my training. I'm actually trained in business. I was a master's of it, uh, management, management engineering graduate in, uh, in undergrad. So I'm trained in business, but I'm an educator at heart. Let me ask you this question. There, uh, not, let me state this fact. There is nothing in our education books, in education theory, nothing that says a semester must be 18 weeks. A semester must be divided into 24 subjects, and every subject must be taught in three in units of three over 18 weeks to complete it. There's nothing that says that's the right way to learn. Some of us here can probably learn what we so what some learn in a semester we can learn it in a week some of us are probably bright enough to learn in a day some can take two months some may take more than a year there is no rule in education and yet we all stuck in these rules i don't know why high school is necessarily four years i don't know why accounting is necessarily four years or i don't know how we determine that engineering should be five years there's no basis of any of this in any education theory and any type of learning theory and yet, tayo, we run our schools by time. Uh, kailangan four years to finish our accountancy, although some of you might be efficient and smart enough to finish it in two. Even the way we process it is linear. You have to learn subject A before subject B before subject C. All of these rules in this day and age must be, we must be willing to change them. Uh, and we actually, in my, in my school, for example, in, in Southwestern, in our, in our business school, what we've done is we've done it that way, and including business and information technology. What we realize, what business is looking for, and this is based on interviews with companies, more interest, they're more interested into the competencies rather than any type of real degree or diploma. Do, do, do their graduates know the skill sets that they need for business? So what we do is we, our kids go through these competencies with, based on projects, working with companies. Now, whether they complete it in a semester or whether they complete it in one month, if they pass the test for these competencies, we don't care. Basta makatapos. Uh, basta makatapos, basta kuha nila yung competency. Uh, uh, that's the most important, thing, uh, most important thing for us. So we have to be willing to change the rules to fit in what's actually happening in the world. No? Second, second, uh, second, what else learning should do. Next slide, please. Especially in today. Let's just think about it. Number one, most likely many of you will not be in one career. You will start out in business, become, an, become a, a chef later on, go into your dis, inter, interior designer later on, go back to business for a while, potentially apply to become a pilot. The record is 10 to 12 changes of career, not job, huh? career. You will shift career. So, Plus, we also don't know what jobs to prepare for kasi nga, ang bilis magbago po ng trabaho. So we don't know what jobs are out there. So what do you do? How do you prepare? I think the call of all business schools and all business education is really to focus less on, on specific or technical competency kasi nagbabago and more on general competencies. Meaning skill sets that will apply regardless of the job you take. 
So kahit anong pasukan yung trabaho, whether piloto, chef, fashion designer, negosyante, uh, entrepreneur, businessman, accounting, finance expert, all of these general competencies will apply. Communication skills, conceptual skills, contextual skills, interpersonal skills, leadership management, and personal. As a matter of fact, if you talk to companies, when you get interviewed for companies, unless you're applying for a specific company like, a, like a, what do you call this, like accounting, most of them will test you on these skills more than they will about the specific skills because I, we can teach you finance. <laughs> Ako, I, I, I took accounting in my management engineering, but I never really learned accounting and what, what the, its importance was until I actually was in companies. Then I understood it more than when I was learning it in school. Uh, and now, until now, I still Google. I actually have a book on financial ratios always with me. I, I still refer to these books. What has gotten many, many of our corporate leaders farther are these skills, these skills that you see in front of you. So that's what you should focus on. Last but not the least, next slide, please, is we must blur the lines between education. Alam nyo, uh, go ahead, you can just click on everything. I just focus on all of these. Katulad na sinabi ko kanina, napaka-linear po ng edukasyon natin. Aral, 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 work, aral, work. But I think it has to change. Uh, and we're seeing it now more and more in other countries and other parts of the world. When you graduate from high school, work for a while, then go back to school. Work for a while again, and then go back to school. Ako ang paningin ko, dahil po sa konsepto na, konsepto na tinatawag nilang micro-credentials or micro-degrees, when you don't spend four years and earn a degree, you may earn a earn micro degree in one semester, good enough to find a job, and then work again, good enough to find a job, such that you might actually end up with a degree eight to 10 years from now. Nangyari po yan sa amin sa business at saka sa IT ulit sa, sa, sa Southwestern. Dahil po, pinag-aralan po namin yung, dahil po they work on projects with companies, tinanong po ko ng dekano namin, ano po mangyari kung ma-hire siya kaagad? One year pala, nagtatrabaho na siya sa, with a company, with a project, ano mangyari kung ma-hire siya? Sabi ko, eh gusto natin yan. Mahal sa kagad because ultimately, our goal is to help our kids improve their lives. If they can get a job and then come back to school later on, okay yan. That's the way we should be. And, and that's how it, it, I think the world will end up going. So don't be, feel pressured. I'm sorry to all the parents out there. Don't feel pressured to finish a degree. Get work experience. Take a gap year. Study, then come back and study. Then go out again and work again. I think this is how the, the world will be built later on. Not on a whole clump of studying, kasi yan ang From ages 6 to 21. One, that's 15 years of straight in school. That's the way it is. I don't think that will happen anymore. I think maybe 12, and then you can work, come back, work, come back. Uh, because nga, you need to learn, unlearn, and relearn. So that's that's we have to blur the lines of skill uh, of uh, education and learning. Uh, I'll just jump to the next slide. And how should you do this? now? This is a call to business and industry. You know, business always talks about how the graduates that come out of the schools are not prepared. But all business does is offer internships or OJT. That's not the way it should work. <laughs> if we really want to make sure we fix this mismatch between industry and education. Business must start working with schools early, as much as early as freshman year. And you have to work with the schools, not just as OJT, but we have to help schools provide the right curriculum by providing input to their curriculum. We have to help schools by providing teachers, opening our doors to access to students and faculty. And if even possible, alam nyo po, accounting is the most difficult, one of the most difficult uh, careers to students uh, uh, professions to hire now. Parang kaga graduate mas accountant, pagka pasa, pasa board, hired na yan, almost automatic. You know, you should start hiring the accountants as early as second or third year, offering them scholarships so that when they graduate, they're committed to you. But industries, that's, is, even industries are afraid to make those changes. So they'll wait for the OJT internships and then try to entice them at, at that point. But these are kind of the lines that need to be cut uh, as we move forward. Uh, I think I'm, I have almost no time left. So I will just end and I'll skip my next slide. And, and, uh, and so this is the point. The world is changing so quickly. And it's changing uh, because of things that even were happening even before the pandemic. The pandemic just hastened the change. Minadali lang yung mga pagbabago. But education must be willing to change. And my advice to the students is, number one, focus on general competencies. Second, be willing to go out into the work, workforce earlier. 
uh, rather than later. If a job is offered to you while in college, take it. Come back to school later on if you if you if you so desire, or find other ways to learn, short-term diploma, certificates, etc. Now let me add to a last. Let me end on a last note of what I think another big change of business education, which is this. Let me quote from Pope Francis. Next slide, please. The role of business is a no, it is the producing wealth and improving the world. This is a speech of Pope Francis to the US Congress on the vocation of business. He says, I would encourage you to keep in mind all those people around us who are trapped in a cycle of poverty. They too need to be given hope. The fight against poverty and hunger must be fought constantly on many fronts. Let me end on this note. I think the biggest change of business education should be the role of business students and business community in changing the world. Alam nyo po, marami pong uh, problema sa mundo dahil po sa sobrang greed ng ating mga negosyante. Hindi lahat po. Ah. Ang problema sa environment, ang problema po sa uh, kahirapan, uh, a lot of these can be resolved if business focuses on its role of producing wealth and distributing wealth and improving the world and helping those who most, are most poor. So actually our call right now in FINMA, in FINMA Education, is to a business that is focuses on inclusive development, that focuses on building a just and sustainable society and a more equitable society. Ito palagay ko, ang pinakamalaking contribution na pwedeng gawin po ng business education is if we can teach our business students and the business community to be more responsible and uh, caring citizens of the world. Yun lang po, maraming salamat ulit at pagkatang hapot po sinilang. Thank you, Dr. Salazar, for that very interesting presentation, challenging us to make paradigm shifts in how we approach and view education. Let us now welcome our next speaker, Dr. Paulo Jamu Francisco. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, good afternoon also, Dr. Cesar Chito. Um, it's nice to come after your presentation. There's a lot of uh, commonalities in the ideas that uh, I also be sharing with you. And uh, I think there's a there's an interesting uh, difference in perspective in terms of size. Uh, Southwest University is, of course, a much larger institution with regard to the number of students uh, versus where I come from. My exposure really has been mainly in the Asian Institute of Management, um, although I also had taught uh, in a large university uh, at Ateneo a few years ago. So I'm just gonna share my screen now. And right. Actually, I echo largely um, what uh, Dr. Salazar had mentioned in terms of how business education is really changing very rapidly. It's been changing even before the pandemic hit, uh, but this pandemic has been a great accelerator. And, and I will not hide the fact that uh, at AIM as well, um, my president and dean, uh, Jik Yong Kang, is, uh, sits as the chair of the AACSB, which is an international accreditation um, body for business schools all over the world. And she had been speaking about this transformation necessary, a digital transformation, but that a change in the kind of competencies that we build with our students, the, the importance of working with, with government and the private sector and all of this. She'd been talking about this over and over again two years ago before the pandemic hit. And much of this, of course, came through very curious ears uh, among our faculty and among the leadership team because we were seeing, oh, okay, we got to do this five years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now. But as it is in most of our industries, this pandemic had accelerated three, five, 10 year trends. And so we had been put in a situation we were, were forced to actually grapple now with the reality of, oh, okay, maybe this future of business education is more like a present situation rather than something that we can put in the back burner or write in our nice three, five year or God forbid, 10 year plans. So in one of the Dean's um, uh, conferences that I got to attend two years ago, uh, one professor was talking exactly about this topic of the future of business education. And he started by sharing a new project supposedly, which their university was putting into. Um, and in particular, this was supposedly a new college. So obviously everyone was excited. And then some people were saying, oh, is it a, is it a data, data science college? Is it a science on uh, bioengineering? Is it a, a science on, is it a new kind of business and humanities kind of college or whatnot? <laughs> and his answer was, well, he flashed a, a photo and he said, we are putting up 
the college of future. Well, it was a joke. I suppose it landed better in the audience that he had. Um, but the idea was, yes, just because we didn't know. Nobody knew what the future was. As, as Chito had said a while ago, we don't know what the future jobs will be. So they simply called it the college of future. Of course, that's a joke. But I suppose when we think about the future, we have certain ideas in our minds, certain imagination uh, that we have, which is really based on what we think is the future version of the present. Is this the future? In the Philippines, this perhaps is a familiar or scary um, picture because uh, prior to this pandemic, uh, IT BPM industry was one of the strongest growth uh, poles of, of our uh, economy and also a, a major employer uh, and has also presented tremendous opportunities for growth for our young workforce. And the fear, I suppose, is you'll now have androids, you'll now have um, robots taking over our jobs. And well, if you are curious, um, you can actually do it now and I don't mind, you can Google um, you can go to www, or sorry, just, just uh, willrobotstakemyjob.com and you can put in your current job position or some sort of variation of that. And this algorithm, which is, by the way, based on a study by Frey and Osborne back in 2016, 2017, will give you a probability score of what is the likelihood that your job will be automated in the future, in the near future. Now, you'll get interesting results. Some jobs which are largely routine or basic, you will see a high probability. Some jobs which uh, supposedly you expect because they are more value, higher value added would have a lower probability. But some results will also be very surprising because I, I think you had mentioned this earlier as well of how you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, you would want to be an accountant, you would want to be a lawyer, you would want to be a scientist, whatever that means, right? Um, and all of these jobs would be like jobs that you have for life. A lot of the things that these people do can now be automated. And so we are in a situation where we have to continue learning and unlearning what we do. Precisely Chico's point earlier. Because in fact, new technologies can destroy jobs. This is a given. We know this. New technologies can destroy jobs. And when new technologies destroy jobs, the problem is that we got to the, therefore equip ourselves with skills which are not automatable. Now, when you say what are the non-automatable jobs, uh, again, four, five years ago, it would be these jobs where supposedly humans still have an edge. They call it perception and manipulation skills in an unstructured environment. If anything, the recent the pandemic has demonstrated to us that the things that we relied on in the past and patterns that we relied on in the past now become more difficult to use in trying to predict the future. So if you as a human being are able to understand an environment that is new and will be able to identify and see new patterns which are emerging and then quickly think of creative solutions to take advantage of it or creative solutions to address certain problems, then that creative intelligence is something which will actually help you not be automatable. Sorry, I'm realizing that my technology is not cooperating with me. My camera, I think, is turning on and off. Anyway, you can focus on the slides while that is happening. So creative intelligence, social intelligence in terms of being able to understand other people, communicate, precisely some of the soft skills or general competencies that Dr. Salazar was referring to earlier. Fantastic. Some people have a more positive outlook. They say, you know, new technologies, just as they can destroy jobs, can produce new jobs because in fact, they can boost our productivity. And when productivity is boosted, again, this is the new conundrum now. Okay, fine. Maybe some of our, our, our competencies remain valuable in the future. But what kind of jobs will we use these for? I think this is a familiar screen that might trigger you now. <laughs> This is not a, <laughs> this is just a slide, don't worry. I don't know how many of you have had this uh, um, situation where you click on a Zoom link and it leads you nowhere. 
<laughs> and this is the screen which pops up. This is the last thing we want to happen to our students, right? We, we carry a very important task here as educators and as administrators of our schools because we promise to equip our students with the skills and the credentials and the certifications, which will make them viable investments, which will make them employable in the future. And the last thing we want to see is when they click on that link, which we've provided, it seems that they couldn't find the job that they needed. So definitely, we have to rethink and reimagine what the future of business education would be. And I want to start with this by saying that you know, humans are difficult to change. Habits are difficult to change. And as much as we always wanna say, we gotta learn how to learn and unlearn at a very rapid rate. Um, our brains and neurons are, you know, they've been wired for quite some time now and, and we've adapted and our brains have adapted to the, to the kind of stimuli that we actually have. So one scientific study supposedly said that younger people now have shorter attention spans because they are actually now in, in, in a world where, you know, you get a gazillion texts and notifications from Instagram or whatnot on your screen. You have to cross the street. You have to listen to your professor. You have to work on your material. You're attending as a meeting all the time. They're so used to stimuli that they crave for that all the time. As opposed to, you know, people like, like, like myself, for example, belonging to a just one generation behind, I will say, <laughs> um, you know, might not be able to multitask as well. So some habits can change, but it takes time. And if it takes too long though, then that means this person will not be able to catch up with the changing environment around him, number one. Number two, with the changing generation of workers they have to compete with, that's another. So as a business school, we need to be able to equip with our students with a dongle, an adapter, right? An adapter which will help them adapt to this world, which is fast moving, fast changing, a world where finishing a four-year degree, God forbid, a PhD, right, a master's degree, will not set you for life. So you need to find that ability to produce that dongle. Here's a photo, um, which I used to ask my students, okay, so is this the kind of future that you want? This is the graduation you want. Right, six months ago, this is what students were clamoring for a graduation. And here's a photo from uh, you know a, an Asian neighbor that we have, um, which seems to be an appropriate use, or is it an appropriate use of technology? Which seems to be an integration of the new robotics and technology that we have. I don't know how you feel about this photo though, but I feel it's a little bit weird, a little bit off, and it makes me beg the question. It begs the question rather of is this an appropriate use of technology? When we say we want to transform business education, is this what you mean? Meaning new ways of doing the same old things. I want to do a lecture, but instead of doing it in a, in a 100 seater lecture room, I'm going to do it over Zoom. In fact, I can even do it better because I can now do a lecture with 400 people watching. New ways of doing old things. I suppose you can continue that. But if you really want to take advantage of the new technologies available, we got to find ways of new things, sorry, of new ways of doing not just old things, but new ways of doing new things. And I think this is also what um, uh, Chito and I are, are, are alluding to when we say we got to rethink and reimagine business education. So what is the future of business education? Um, here's, uh, 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 I'm, I'm actually borrowing some of these ideas from a, uh, a pioneering article. Um, an education on the future of business education. And I think these are words which uh, are familiar to some of us now. Maybe as students, you hear this in the, you saw this in the brochures of your organizations or, or us as educators or you in the business world. Um, things which, which make sense, analytical thinking, the world is full of wicked problems. You got a better way to find out, okay, what are, what's, the main, what's the main problem? Um, what are the interrelatedness of concerns and how do we come up with a solution that is evidence-based? Analytical thinking. Two, future business education has to do with industry and academia working together, linking together. Um, look, at the, look at the miracle of AstraZeneca's uh, new vaccine. I know there are some pros and cons to it, and some people say that it's not as effective maybe as the others. I don't know. Uh, but AstraZeneca is a clear, AstraZeneca's vaccine is a clear example of how industry and academia can work together to come up with a solution. A solution, by the way, that is judged not just by the effectiveness of the vaccine, but also in terms of the cost and how readily available supposedly it can be if only things panned out right um, with their manufacturing. If you wanna solve job skills mismatch, you need this industry and academia link. 
Chito also a while ago, and I echo this, uh, mentioned how important it is that businesses now and the students who go through business school appreciate the generation and the milieu and the zeitgeist that they now live in. We are in a society where we finally recognize the private interests of profit-making firms and social objectives cannot and should not be dichotomized from each other. They must overlap. And if we truly want to solve social ills, poverty, problems of pollution, avoiding disaster, we got to work together. Our students have to be instilled with that. And finally, last but not the least, we want our students to take advantage of the new technologies, innovate, create value out of the new abilities that we have, and dare to take risks, be proactive, be entrepreneurial. These four, I would say, are the future of the aspects or the tenets of future business education. in 1964. These points were from an article published in 1964. So if, if we are finding ourselves in a situation still trying to do this, we are trying to fix a problem or trying to address issues which were there 80, sorry, 60 years hence. So many things have happened even just last year and this pandemic has happened and we have seen a transformation again of universities, of business and society of the student. And to top it all off, we have got to address all of these with new constraints. Even if we have new technologies that will allow us to tackle these transformations, our constraints are still there. So wow, we are in a very tough spot. Luckily, the innovation is there. And when we innovate, we have to ask our question again, what, what will be the value of the university? Really? And whenever my students talk about value and value creation, I want them to take a look at this question. If you're to try to make sense of the value of your university, the value of your business, the question to ask is what would you miss for if you were God? Ano yung pagtinanggal mo, yung company na to or yung organization na to, then it will be missed. And this is now maybe the guiding light for the next few slides that I have. The university has to transform. It used to be campus centric, it used to be faculty centric. Now we understand because of what's going on in the pandemic, it can be, and it should be perhaps, online if not blended. One that will be allowed, that will allow you to go omnichannel. If retail can go omnichannel, and if consumers have accepted that, then why not information and education, which supposedly, at least in terms of the characteristics of the product, should be something that is akin to such. Two, echoing um, uh, the presentation that came before me, the university used to provide a product which was heavily centralized and that focused on quality. It's the best school. Which school has the best assurance of learning? Which school is able to have the top graduates, right? Based in, and you're looking at different means of measuring quality. But if just as in business, we are now recognizing that yes, quality is assurance is important, but really what we have to decide and decide on and actually decipher from the market is what is the value that each customer actually gets from our product. And we're beginning to realize digital marketing and all of these tools have actually made us realize, number one, and also enable us to actually cater, almost customizing to each personal customer. Why should education not follow the same suit? Where the emphasis has to now go to, what is really the value that people are getting from the education that they're paying for? And that would require now a re-examination of what is really the producto which is being bought. Education used to be perceived as a product bundle. You gain skills because of teaching opportunities or learning opportunities. You are assessed in it and then you're certified. Increasingly, we are moving towards a direction where maybe we have to reimagine the university as a service, as a need to use and therefore need to access service because that is the way that we can actually take advantage of the technologies we have. And at the same time, go over the, the, the constraints that we have in terms of resources, physical or financial. So when we say unbundling education, we're talking about how, if you look, you used to think of the education process as teaching, assessment, and certification that always leads to a degree. Is that really how the world works now? Again, I echo the presentation earlier of saying that learning can come from everywhere. You could Google while in class, and you can come up with the answer quickly, more quickly than the lecture in front of you. 
So if that's the case, what is the strength that still remains to be the competitive advantage of a university? Is it in integration of your bias, your 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 uh, your, 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 your learning coming from all over the place? Is it in the form of assessment that will really be able to certify whether somebody has the competencies that supposedly they have? Maybe the university is an assessment powerhouse. Now, the university is changing, but the businesses and society at Surge are also changing from the 40 work hour week in the office to flexible work arrangements to a business and society and organizations that now realize that it's not just about profit making, but building resilience in an inclusive ecosystem and sustainable business. You also have a transformation of the student. Students now are no longer just adaptive learners, which you and I, or some of us have been trained to be, which is you have to learn and unlearn new things quickly. But increasingly, the new generations are more akin to wanting to become generative learners, meaning they want to learn new ideas which are totally unrelated to what they're doing. They want to experiment with new behavior and they're not afraid of, of, of losing a job or losing a career because in their view, a career is not once in a lifetime. Everyone, younger kids, are talking about aiming for a better version of themselves and they're taking it to heart. Maybe that's the kind of students that we have now and that's the kind of students that we have to cater to. This echoes what Jita was showing a while ago of how we are now moving into a non-linear life stage where you can always go back to your education and learn more and learn more. And the learning is a process which doesn't end. I wish I could tell you what the future university will be like, but I can't. But this is where, take this as an invitation to students, to you students, um, to business, the business sector as well, and to government and our regulators, that now is the time to start reimagining, not just rethinking, because sometimes thinking only gets us somewhere. We got to reimagine new ways of doing new things, of really looking at what is the value of education? Is it a degree? Is it a cert certificate? Is it learning skills which, are employed, which will make us employable in the future? Is it something which makes us a better version of ourselves once we figure out what that means? Thank you, and if you have uh, any further questions, uh, I do think there is a, a Q and A portion where we can actually have that discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Francisco. Very interesting insights on how we reimagine the future of business education. Uh, I'll now introduce our moderator for this session, Mr. Antonio Ramon Tony Boy Ongshako. Mr. Ongshako is the president and director in Deed Realty and Development Corporation. House of Ongshako Inc. and is CEO, President, and Director of First Planters Pawn Shop Inc., Paychex Pawn Shops, and PowerNet Systems Corp., a network solutions provider. He joined Finex in 1998 and has joined several committees at Finex, the Junior Finex Committee, the Membership Committee, Environment Committee, and the Programs Committee. He was the 2005 and 2006 Junior Finex Chairman and was a director from 2006 to 2010 as well as the Executive Vice President of Phoenix in 2009. Again, he served in Phoenix as Director in 2017 and 2018, as well as Vice President and Director in 2019 and 2020. Currently, he is a trustee of the Phoenix Foundation and Research. I will now turn over the speakers to our moderator, Mr. Tony Boyong Shafo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to our speakers. Good afternoon to... Uh... Dr. Chito Salazar and Dr. Jamul Francisco. It's nice to see that uh, Chito and I have the same hairstylist. <laughs> and Jamul <laughs> being younger. But I, I, I think we all come from the same uh, school in Katipunan. <laughs> <laughs> so there goes diversity of views. <laughs> 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 I can't, I can't. <laughs> okay, now... Um, you know, it's very interesting to know that in business, uh, there's a lot of companies that have gone uh, the way of the dodo bird, you know. Uh, example, Blockbuster is gone. It failed to innovate. Uh, another company is Kodak, remember? When you were younger, it became even a buzzword for taking pictures. And now it is gone. Okay, well... It's still there, but it's not anymore into, in, in, into the camera uh, uh, space. So with that, education has already uh, changed a lot 
and the uh, the tools for 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 remote learning has always been there and the pandemic just hastened it okay i've also you uh, seen uh, videos or even talks on what will be the jobs that will be disappearing in 10 years okay and uh, briefly when jamu uh, when jamu said to go to will ro uh, robots <laughs> take my job ai so i briefly went there okay and uh, it seems to be accountants is one of those jobs that will probably disappear. It has a 50% chance of disappearing because primarily it's a rules-based uh, discipline. However, a related field like finance managers only has a 6% chance of disappearing and only has a 6% chance of disappearing. I mean, it's, it will still be there more than what accountants are. And this uh, reimagining of the university, uh, what the university uh, is for, uh, <clears throat> comes to the concept that we must, again, learn, relearn, and unlearn all of this. And through my career, I started as a banker, then I moved into IT, <laughs> and that's really a very far field. No? And so I, I had to learn, uh, I had to relearn a lot of skills and I had to relearn online. I had to attend a lot of seminars just to get this up. Uh, my question is, uh, in Southwestern University, University and in AIM, how are you approaching uh, this concept of, uh, of general competencies, of general uh, competencies. Uh, siguro, uh, uh, let, let me begin. Uh, uh, Dr. Jamus' uh, sure, sure, uh, sure. Uh, presentation is actually, his age market is very different from mine. No? Uh, first graduate students, uh, most likely from a, a higher income bracket, minor mid-income, as I mentioned. And I, it's not just for Southwestern, but for all of the schools in FINMA mm -hmm. education. We have about nine schools in the Philippines. Uh, We've integrated what we call core work skills into our all of the curriculum. The, the difficult people with, with, with integrating these kind of skill sets, it's not traditional in the sense that you give a reading. You don't teach collaboration by giving a student a reading on collaboration. You actually have to exercise it through group work uh, or things like that. Uh, uh, so we've, in, we've our, our main thrusts are critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, communication skills, uh, confidence confidence we've integrated it and they have we have to teach our teachers how to teach it uh in all of their classes whether their classes are finance accounting marketing they need to be able to integrate all of these now they, but but I, I think the challenge uh for our schools and, and and even for for our government in the regulatory framework is we have all of these rules that we're used to that are not that 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 actually defy all of these things. Let me give an example. Uh, I, my favorite line, what we call cheating in school, we call collaboration in the workplace. No? Uh, we, we, Boy, that's true, huh? <laughs> exactly, right? But, but for us, you have to do your work by yourself. But tell me who in our workplace solves most business problems by themselves. They normally work in a team. So should we not be considering forgetting these individual practices, uh, individual grades, and focus more on team grades and problem solving as, as groups rather than as individuals? Except that to do that, you'll have to change not just, not just uh, the schools, right? And the teachers who are used to teaching this way. And it's easier to test one than to test group work, but you also have to change things like the board exams and all of that stuff. But we're trying. We're trying to add all of these things. But I think it takes much, much more than that to much, much more than the schools to actually change what our kids need. No? Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, mm. um, so, so just before I answer your question about, um, you know, like our concrete steps towards, uh, you know, putting our mouth, so our, 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 how does that go again? Our, our feet where our mouth is, whatever. Anyway, um, is, you know, it, it really is an, a coordination problem. Uh, when I say it's a coordination problem, meaning, and that's why I think venues like these are very important because we, we, we get to tell the other side what we're planning to do. What do I mean? Uh, sure, it's competencies that are important. Sure, it is learning by experience that it's important. And therefore, why is it that we still need a degree anyway if it's experience that counts? Um, are we just now a curator of experience? Two, uh, yeah, in the actual workplace, we work in teams. We always work in teams. Uh, there are just few and far between functions where we work on our own. Maybe, you know, maybe program, not even a program, maybe a teacher. 
<laughs> worse actually because how a teacher is supposed to teach you uh, how to work in teams. When a teacher, when he does academic research, tends to do it on his own. Um, and yet, when we go to the workplace, if businesses also still look at, oh, okay, look at the assessment. It's, it has to be individual assessment. You, you are an honorable mention. You're cum laude. You are not, right? I mean, so, 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 so it is a coordination problem also. And it's got a lot to do with trust, I suppose, because your grades and our assessments are signals of how good you are with your competencies. And unless we can find a way to coordinate assessment, training, right? And, and actually going, you know, coming to your work and, and being able to do the work that you're, you're doing with that trust, then, you know, there is immediately a, a hurdle. And now, so having said that constraint, I think any business school or any school will have to balance it out because on the one hand, we want action consulting projects. So we have a lot of these, right? Uh, because you want critical thinking, addressing a wicked problem. Uh, of course, we want to take uh, advantage of participant-centered learning. Uh, uh, AIM, as you might know, has always been a fan of, they call it the case method. Uh, nowadays, it's not just 30-page cases that we look at, but you have simulation games, you have, you have short cases and all of these things. And the idea is you come to the classroom you're not, you're not just taught. In fact, Mike Better is that you're not taught um, the concept or the, or the lecture or the framework, but you are actually asked to apply it. And you discuss an issue that the, a company is facing. And maybe you throw in the framework now to see whether the framework works and whether it applies. For sure, we've been doing that. And yet, despite all of that action, there is also a need to be able to certify at an individual level. So you got to balance out and just the same. So uh, we're, we're very known for our MBA and our MDM programs, business administration and development management programs. At the DNA of these are they're very generalist programs. But in the last 10 years or so, there was a trend in the master's uh, level to going specialization. If you're not specializing, if you don't offer a major in what or, or you're a master's in finance or financial entrepreneurship or whatever, then it becomes, you know, you're, you become less competitive in the market. And yet at the same time, there's this talk of generalist and general competencies. So it's a balancing act that we got to do. And I think the schools that have become more successful in balancing that out of how do you build those competencies and also working in teams with the requirements of individual assessment and also specialization, these are the ones that can, um, you know, that can be able to serve their markets better. Uh, Tony, can I can I add just one thing? Uh, sure. I like what uh, Dr. Jabo said, uh, but let me add this something that, that schools can do to help build this uh, general competencies. I think the challenge is to our teachers is to change your teaching style. The Filipino yeah. teacher is taught is teaches by lecture. That is out the door. The, the old tradition is the teacher is the font of all wisdom. Uh, the, right now, the font of all wisdom is a teacher called Google, right? Uh, you don't need the teacher anymore. You can get everything on, on Google. So the teacher must be a facilitator of knowledge, a teaching the kids how to learn, how to process information, but not be the source of information necessarily. Uh, and that's a whole change of teaching style where, where hopefully the student now becomes more in control of their learning rather than the teacher. Dati rati kailangan mo ng teacher para matuto. What the teachers now need to do is that the students themselves become self-taught and self-learners. That's a very different change, but that's the way it has to go uh, if we want to prepare our kids for the future. So you're saying yeah, can that I just the teacher should be different... more of a, a facilitator, more yeah. of a manager or for a facilitator. Okay, let me ask you again. How is your respective organizations uh, approaching uh, leadership training, good governance, and critical thinking. How do you inject this now into your curriculum? And how do you make the students uh, uh, learn these very important skills? You know, I remember when I was still at college, EQ wasn't even talked about at that time. Uh, even more so when Benny Sullivan was in college, uh, the, I think uh, the computers were still being invented. Sorry, Benny. <laughs> How do you guys approach this uh, 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 teaching good governance, teaching critical thinking, teaching leadership uh, skills? Because this is really what is needed nowadays. Yeah, actually, this is related to what I wanted to share earlier about the teachers. So on the one hand, it, it, it does rely on the pedagogy that you choose. So with the pandemic happening, um, and actually we had these plans even before the pandemic to adopt blended learning. Uh, 
at least two of our programs, we now have eight, nine programs, if you count our latest PhD in data science. Um, out of these nine programs, two programs have adopted the blended learning format. So blended learning, uh, in, in, in the way we define it, the definition that we use, is it's a combination, a blend of synchronous and asynchronous activities. So synchronous, meaning we're all doing this activity at the same time. It could be in a physical classroom, a physical space, or a digital venue like Zoom or, or Teams or whatnot. So you do it all together. Asynchronous activities are activities that you can do as individual groups or individually outside classroom time. So we've adopted this for two of our programs, the Master in Development Management Program and an Executive Master in Disaster Risk and Crisis Management Program. And when we made this shift last year, it was just last year, January, when the first program was run, um, sorry, this year, January, when it run, um, I will tell you, a lot of our faculty were, they were willing, but they found it challenging, um, not so much as to move to case method or participant-centered, because we've been doing that for quite some time, but to go blended meant, just to oversimplify, slashing in half your course outline into sessions which you will have a virtual, uh, sorry, a, a virtual synchronous session like where you can lecture or whatever you want to do. And the other half is independent. The challenge for them was how do I pick and choose? Because again, it's all about value. If I am only going to meet my class five times out of 10 and the rest of the 5.5 five units, they will have to work on their own. I have to maximize the learning opportunity of the time we're together. And this is really where you're, you said, talking about governance issues, making those strategic decisions, I, you know, uh, you know, make critical thinking, uh, deciding on the gray. That's, those are the things that we can take full advantage of by having multiple perspectives you're, while you're in that virtual uh, or synchronous session. So um, less and less do we have or do we tackle the framework, the technical stuff, right, during the sessions and, and we, we flip the classroom so that they study that on their own and they are forced to, prepare beforehand and come in the classroom prepared. And again, for me, that's a coordination problem because you, you got to insist in doing that for every session and for all courses. Otherwise, your students, why aren't you teaching me? You're being paid to teach. <laughs> um, until eventually, um, and, and that's the wrong kind of teaching, I suppose, which, which we want to do because that's not the teaching anymore that's needed in this future that we're talking about. Chito? Uh, well, well, in our case, uh, the, the way we do it is, well, we'd like to, we're encouraging more project-based learning. So uh, working right away on their projects with companies, with corporations. And in terms of the uh, ethics, we actually are, are integrating a lot of uh, programs on civic education in our, in our, in our curriculum. Uh, as well, and actually, there's also an opportunity to practice their civic education. Uh, we, we, one of one of the big, uh, big projects this this past few months, of course, has been to get our kids to register <laughs> for the election as part of all of this now. Uh, uh, but we can only do so much uh, for these things. But I think we're we're trying. We're trying. Okay, there's a question that uh, uh, that one of the members has uh, posted here. Our country has unsustained economic growth due to stagnant uh, te uh, capital technology formation. Since you mentioned that new technology destroys jobs, where do we draw the line in investing in new technology if our aim is to also create opportunities through it? I think that's more for Dr. Jabo. <laughs> yeah, the answer is, do, I mean, in my view, I'm throwing a question, do, should we draw a line? I mean, each technology can destroy jobs and can boost productivity at the same time. It is perhaps a, the better question would be how do we equip, what kind of support do we need, right? Um, to provide to businesses, to individuals, to educational institutions to make sure or to help them that, you know, so that the net benefit is positive. Uh, when the ATM machine, <laughs> was invented and became popular, everyone thought that people will, you know, that your bank tellers will lose their jobs and it will forever change banking. Um, well, apparently it's the pandemic that, that, that probably made that. <laughs> Let's see how, how that goes uh, moving forward. But, but looking at that example, yes, bank tellers didn't lose their jobs. Um, I, I don't have the figures now, but, but, but there was a, a, an article that actually studied uh, the number of, of bank teller jobs in the U.S., uh, after the ATM was um, was uh, popularized, 
the number of bank teller jobs remained this in fact it increased why because well bank tellers right uh, now took on more higher value added uh, functions so it's less clerical and maybe it's more about you know explaining new products uh, uh, figuring out you know the specific needs and whatnot now it, yet to see how the pandemic will, will affect that because now a lot of branches are closed and everyone has finally learned to do digital banking, right? But again, the idea is more than say, okay, bawal, no automation of X or no investment in robotics, no investment in 3D printing uh, because that will hurt jobs. Uh, it, that might actually cause more harm than good because again, nobody can predict the future. Instead, enable and make sure you have that working environment which will allow people to adapt. And is that scary? Yes. But have we done it in the Philippines? Uh, we welcomed the third industrial revolution, digitalization in terms of the internet, computerization, if you still use that term, ICT. And what? how did we benefit from that? Did we lose jobs? Probably. Did we create jobs? Yes. IT, BPM industry, the semiconductor electronics industry, two industries which were growth holds for the economy. New technology, we let them in, and we were lucky. And maybe we did some few things right to make ourselves ready for that. We just got to make sure we do we 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 depend less on chance and uh, be more deliberate moving forward to take advantage of fourth industrial revolution technology. Uh, oh, Tony, uh, I think I don't think people are always afraid of AI. But as Dr. Jamo pointed out, you know there has been no major technological development in the world that has led to a net loss of employment. It's always led to a net gain. Think all the way back from uh, navigational tools to the printing press. More recently, I guess we can all we can all understand mechanization. We all thought that the trucks would ease out uh, uh, farmers or uh, automation in the factories. Yeah. But but there will they create more jobs actually, including IT. We we're all afraid of IT, but but there will be some jobs that will face out. So there is a role for government here. There's a role for government, and you have seen it already in India, we're seeing it in Singapore, to prepare for automation. They're providing subsidies to retrain, to retrain, uh, up, up, up train, uh, upskill, what they call upskill, retrain workers who might lose out because there will be more jobs created elsewhere <laughs> in other areas. And we need to do that. Uh, we need to subsidize those who will lose their jobs, factory workers, uh, in, uh, farmers. They all needed to be subsidized and prepared for transitions to other jobs. But netto, net to the economy, any new technology has actually improved the employment opportunities rather than reduced it. Yes, I agree with that. In fact, uh, throughout history, it has, also, it has shown that uh, technological advances actually creates new opportunities for new jobs. Uh, there's another question from a student this time. With the rapid technological evolution, do you think that we can adapt more from technology with how the learning process is of today? Uh, I, I'll, I'll hazard a guess first for, for my students, at least for, for college students. Uh, una, uh, we have to stop thinking of technology as, as uh, devices, devices, laptops, etc. Te technology could be changes in, in procedures and processes, etc. So, so I think that there, uh, especially, the, I, I just connected to the a previous question on inequity. If you keep on thinking of technology as as uh, uh, devices, then to all magkakaroon ng inequity in bansa, no? Because uh, the access to devices, access to internet is very is, is not equitable. However, if you, if you think of technology of improving our processes, finding new ways of doing things, like for example, for the system, I mean, we knew uh, our market would not have regular access to internet. So we actually did not go on an internet-based learning. We went on an analog system, but we had to redo it, rethink it. We added some technology to it so our teachers can be in touch with the students. We supported it with other things. We changed the process and that in many ways, is a technological development that was a innovation on how learning is delivered. So, so can we adapt? Yes, we can. But we have to stop thinking of the solution as automatically digital or or, or going internet based. We have to look at the entire system and find ways how we can adapt that system. Yeah. And to add to that, um, even if we do depend on digitalization. Uh, increasingly, these digital services are becoming more affordable. In, in, in fact, um, it's, it's like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you need to have that, you know, there's a threshold of like, can I afford to go digital? And can I, go, can I afford to go online? Uh, the pandemic, if anything, has demonstrated to us 
that even for our small firms, right? Maybe it'll be more problematic for the micro, but the, anecdotally, we've also heard of new micro enterprises being set up, taking advantage of digital, digital marketplaces. These marketplaces online, the Lazada, Shopee's of the world, these are new fields, new playing fields by which the small or the very small has a chance at the very least, right? To reach a market which it never had an opportunity to in the past. So imagine now you're seeing, um, and again, anecdotally, you have one man run or one woman run shows of operations selling a certain product, going head to head with a Watson's, right? Or a major distributor on one of these platforms. And with some, not equal, but some good chance of competing with the other, right? And so it can be taken advantage of, right? And just to echo now of the, the idea of technologies being a new way of doing things, not necessarily AI, digital, or whatnot. Exactly. Why? Because I'm going to the other extreme. You go digital, you go online, you have Excel, you have Viber, um, you have Zoom. That doesn't make you digitally transform. <laughs> um, a, a transformation, a digital tra that's digitalization, but a digital transformation would mean I have to find new ways of doing new things using whatever digital tool that I have. So you might have all of the money in the world and all of the digital tools, but if you don't have that creative imagination or whatever you want to call it to transform what you do to something totally new, useless. Oh, okay, uh, maybe not useless, but you know you don't maximize the potential. Of. Okay, there's a question here from one of the members, uh, Vic Sarsa, who's really old. How do we equip our youth and what do we equip them with to make them adaptable to what you say is an ever-changing job environment? Uh, Dr. Jabo, why did you go first? Uh -huh. um, I, I won't go because maybe we could answer this two ways. One way is very specific, like to look at skills and whatnot. Um, you know, I guess go to the website of Southwestern, go to the website of AIM, and those are our bets of what we think are the literal technical functions or skills that people need. You know? But I would want to emphasize what I think both of us were, were, were highlighting a while ago of a change in mindset and this capability of learning and then learning and learning new things. Um, we have got to find ways, even in the classroom or in our programs and courses, to welcome and to be open to other sources of learning. Right? Yes, there is a business case for saying we need to develop everything in-house. Yes, there is that business profitability case, but is it a sustainable one? Is it the right one? Because we know that outside school, people get information from, and come on, if they get it from Facebook, then that means they're willing to get it from all over the place, right? But we have to find a way to, okay, how do you integrate that? How do you make it okay? For example, one of my, my beefs really is when um, some of my colleagues uh, do not allow students to keep their laptops on and go online while in class. Of course, an exam maybe is an exception, maybe. But for me, it's like because they're afraid. Oh, they'll they'll Google the the answer or whatnot. And I'm I, of course they will. And we want that because the last thing we want is a person who doesn't know where X Street is in Quezon City, because in my view, this should have all the answers. You should use it. So we should, we, should, we should be worried about other stuff instead. So, so just being open to multiple sources of learning, uh, that's important. Uh, just one quickly, Harvard edX, Harvard has a, has a platform for uh, online learning, which also allows different third-party providers to create their own courses online, and then people can subscribe, and, and, and it's almost like a, a stackable thing that you can, you can put together. edX had been sold by Harvard and MIT to an edtech company for $800 million in the middle of the pandemic. This is telling us two things. One, there's money in edtech. Two, people are putting bets in education, which is no longer centralized. So perhaps we have to move into that direction as well. Oh, my, my, I think, I think uh, my, my, uh, my presentation, I think, said it all. It really is to focus on general, general uh, competencies. But the difficulty is you only have enough. You only have four years and roughly 24 times, roughly uh, 30, roughly uh, X number of units no? uh, to fill. And what happens is you talk to any professional, they want to fill it with all of their courses. I think we have to be ready to streamline and accept that some of these classes, let's say in accounting or finance, they will learn on the job. 
uh, you know, they, they will learn it on the job. So it's more important to get the bigger skills, which which they will have less opportunity to learn on the job. So, like, you know, I, I actually think that, uh, do you know that one of the most sought after competencies that is uh, of business people huh, is creativity. Now tell me which which finan- which business program in any of our schools teach creativity. So my advice to all of you future business people, take up drama, uh, take up literature, uh, go to any program that allows you to broaden your thinking, practice your communication skills, and explore, explore. This will prepare you more for a business. And then in the last semester, you read up on finance. <laughs> I think this will better prepare you for a business career. Dr. Jabu, because MBA, it's you have to, that's, it's a little bit more focused. But I think for young kids about to leave their college, think about breadth rather than depth. Uh, broaden rather than deepen. There's, a, there's an interesting question posed by a student. Uh, uh, It basically the question is uh, because of the challenge brought about by the COVID 19 uh, pandemic, how will you create opportunities uh, when a lot of the students are swallowed by their own anxieties, leading them to lose their confidence because of this pandemic? So it's more of a mental uh, mental issue. Uh, okay, totoo yung sinabi ni Tony, uh, it's more of a mental issue of which, uh, well, definitely one, I think all of the schools now, and by the way, again, huh, we have, uh, we, we, I, I visited Fordham maybe about four or five years ago, and as early as four to five years ago, before the pandemic, they were already sharing with me that one of the largest problems in all U.S. universities was the increasing problem of mental wellness, uh, mental health as far back as even before the pandemic. So again, I go back to my first proposition that these trends were happening even before the pandemic. The pandemic just hastened them, made uh, raised them up. So I think the universities now are realizing that we do need to deal with mental wellness uh, as, a, as a key factor in all of our programs. And it has to be built into the, into the programs as well, which basically might mean trying to, again, again, uh, free up time for the students, uh, uh, be be less rigid in terms of times and deadlines and timing. Uh, but again, ang hirap, ang hirap kasi ang, ang, ang education is ironically one of the most rigid institutions in the world. Mm. It's it's the institution which has responded to the internet the slowest mm. <laughs> uh, of all of all sectors. Which is really funny, no? Because we're the we're supposed to be the free thinkers. Mm. So. Para mangyari po to, marami sa mga sinasabi ko na, na ni Dr. Jabo at sinasabi ko, bago para sila mang, pa, para mangyari po yan, dapat handa po yung mga administrasyon at ang gobyerno na to free up the rules and regulations around education. Yeah, because the obsession had always been in quality, eh? which which makes sense. I, I guess it makes sense even in a business sense no? that, that, that you, you want to make sure it meets a certain metric. Right, so it's always about assurance, assurance of learning and quality. But, but, but again, it, it's now you might have what is the right quality, but the right quality might depend on what is it that's being valued by your student. And, and increasingly now, the mental health and self actualization uh, are the words that I used um, a while ago, and, and that matters to people. So, so just to share one of our programs, the Master in Entrepreneurship program uh, that we have is, is quite unique for, for, for two reasons. One, is um, which makes it unique from other masters in entrepreneurship programs is that when you enroll, you have to have a, a registered business already. So it's not like you as a wannabe entrepreneur, but rather you already are heading your enterprise, right? And you enroll it basically with yourself when you enter the program. But two, and this is uh, which which I think is all about self actualization, is part of the program really is uh, coaching and. Uh, like more deliberately following the journey of the student as an entrepreneur. Because, and we realize this, especially for small businesses, that if, if you're a business owner, you are also your businesses. So what happens in your head, your issues mentally, privately, in the family are also the issues that will always overlap with your business. And so in the past, the idea is, ay, wag natin pasukan yan, professional tayo, dito lang tayo sa business lang. That's not how people live. <laughs> That's not how people are. So it has to be integrated. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how we do that in other programs and other schools also do that in other programs. Uh, Tito, you want? 
No, I already. Uh, oh yeah. I, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's a one again from another student. Most companies require one to three years experience for an entry level position. He read a lot of articles about entry level jobs, and there is a debate on which HR and companies must reevaluate their hiring methods especially to new graduate and students in these pandemic years. Uh, what recommendations do you suggest or should companies do right now to help new graduates find their own journey and start their own careers after leaving school six years after college and senior high, six years after college? Uh, so yeah, uh, since it's, it's, it's uh, college and the search for the first career, I hope Totoy sinabi po ni, ni Ian Kester, no? uh, it's not to fix this world, it's not just the schools that need to change, the companies need to change. So, ito, uh, we're putting on another hat, uh, po ng Philippine Business for Education sa mga kumpanya. We have to change, you're, you're exactly right. We've been asking companies to reevaluate what they're looking for. So, ang sinabi namin, when you post ad advertisements, don't put the, the credentials, you need a BS degree or a uh, whatever. Focus on the competencies you need. Uh, it's actually globally, many companies are already searching for competencies rather than specific degrees. It's you. You have both sides. Eh? You have college graduates who don't have the competencies, and then you have undergraduates with no degree who already have the competencies. So why will you rely? Parang the degrees are becoming less. Should be less and less an indicator and more specific competencies. Companies are also moving forward. Industries, more than companies, are moving towards industry certification to test kids' skills and competencies. So parang in many, in many parts of the world, a, a graduate with a, coding, with a coding certificate from Microsoft will get paid more than an IT graduate from a top school in the US. This is true, huh? This is not uh, an invention because they look for hard coders rather than kalimutan na natin yung everything else. So uh, that's one of the things we're trying to do is suggest that companies drop the search for credentials and specify specify uh, competencies. And second, that's again, what I what I mentioned in my in my presentation, we're encouraging companies to start working with the schools early. Because when, when when, if, if a company works, for example, with IT or business students on projects, for their program, for their, let's say, leading to a finish, a complete, let's say, a marketing project to complete the marketing requirements of a particular semester, not only do they help the students learn, <laughs> by working with the students, they get a better feel of the, anong kakayahan ng estudyante. This has, to, and so, that's why the biggest, the bigger fear is they hire the students even before they graduate. Uh, fear of many schools because we might lose our students. That's, so those are the kind of suggestions. Companies do have to change. Both sides need to change. The schools and the companies need to change. Jamu, you have any uh, comment on that? Uh, not much so, because so far we are not in the undergraduate <laughs> space. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it, 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 in fact, uh, some, 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 some of our students come into the master's programs precisely to well, credentialize, right? And to, to become more competitive so that he, as far as long as they meet that three year, I think it's a, it's a minimum requirement for the MBA, uh, then by finishing an MBA, then some companies will view them as, you know, equivalent to someone with five years or six years or something like that. No? Um, but an important thing just for me to echo as well is that the, it, companies also have to understand, okay, like really what, what, what is important to them? If, 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 if leaders of companies are saying now it's competencies that matter, then your job postings <laughs> should, um, should reflect that as well. No? Uh, and, and for our part in, in the graduate schools, um, we are actually much more open now to, to varying like interdisciplinary uh, backgrounds. In fact, we find it so exciting when we have non-business people coming into your business graduate programs because, uh, and this is me speaking as a mentor of some of these students that I've had a chance to, to, to witness uh, their journey is that, um, you know, people coming from the arts, I always tell this, no, who, who enter our MBA or whatnot, uh, tend to fare not just as good, but sometimes much better than those in the hardcore business functions before they enter. Again, because it's like a blank slate. They're, they're more open to the innovation that we actually want to teach and the value creation that we want them to learn. Thank you, Joe. You know, the, the, the two of you, what you're, what you're just basically saying, there's a Tagalog word for what you two are just basically trying to impart. Kailangan maging maabilidad kayo. Tama ba? <laughs> 
Kasama din yan. Kasama din yan. But not... Uh... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's precisely what it is. And, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, adaptability or what they call maabilidad is actually the name of the game in this uh, growing world of, of, of technical, uh, technical evolution. No? Uh, okay. Uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Jamu. And thank you very much, Chito, for... For this Salamatid. very very uh, 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 interesting uh, topic, you know, and uh, maybe I'll turn this over now to our uh, masters of ceremony, EJ. Uh, EJ, are you are you there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony Boy, Doctor Salazar, and Doctor Francisca. That was a very interesting and informative discussion. I, I wish we had more time to keep it going, uh, but may I now call on Phoenix Foundation Chairman. Mr. Jose Jerome Jeng Pascual III to present, to present the Certificate of Appreci Appreciation to our two speakers and to deliver his closing remarks. Oh, by the way, uh, don't forget, don't leave because we have a raffle. Yes, thank you, Tony Boy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, EJ and uh, Tony Boy for that reminder. Uh, and thank you once again to uh, Dr. Chito and Dr. Jamu for, for you know, the very splendid and insightful um, a sharing you did this afternoon. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, present you with these uh, certificates of appreciation. Um, you will be receiving separate certificates. We just put both of your names here for, uh, for uh, ease of uh, reading them out. So let, let me read the citation. The Phoenix Research and Development Foundation Incorporated presents the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Chito B. Salazar to Dr. Jamil Paolo S. Francisco as guest speakers during the 2021 Phoenix Conference Session 8, Reshaping Business Education in the Face of Disruption, Addressing Challenges and Seizing Opportunities. Given the seventh day of October, 2021, assigned by Dr. Mildred B. Vitamkol, Chairperson of the Junior Phoenix Committee, Mr. Benito G. Sullivan III, liaison trustee for the Junior Phoenix Committee, and yours truly. Thank you uh, once again, uh, Dr. Chito and Dr. Jam. Thank you very much. All right, um, maybe, uh, well, uh, like I said, uh, I'd like to thank our distinguished speakers uh, for sharing their insights and perspectives uh, on how business education needs to evolve in light of uncertainty and disruption. Um, if we recall, uh, Dr. Chito uh, shared his three revo revolutionary propositions and his advocacy that we should uh, rethink the process of learning. Um, this is because the drivers of change, particularly the nature of work and how we learn, will make graduates obsolete quite quickly unless they adapt. I agree with Dr. Chito that focusing on general competencies and getting work experiences early among others, will take you further in your intended career or careers. Uh, for Dr. Jamil, um, he underscored that education is changing very rapidly, accelerated by the pandemic and digital transformation. Technological developments will uh, impact future jobs and education needs to keep up in order to ensure graduates will continue to be employable. This means thinking of new ways to do new things and transforming the concept of what a university is and reimagining what education can be. One of the interesting points that Dr. Jamil mentioned is the need to establish partnerships between business and the academe. This is one of the key focus areas of JPhoenix and the Phoenix Foundation, and also why we are having this forum today. My heartfelt thanks once again to Dr. Chito and Dr. Jamu for the, for the both enlightening and intriguing concept and ideas on how to future-proof education. Now, um, for the benefit of all the students and youth present in this afternoon's forum, let me share with you another perspective on education, a perspective from the opposite end of the career timeline. And this perspective essentially confirms what we have heard from our esteemed speakers. I took early retirement in April this year after almost 35 years of working in Shell after 13 different roles and 20 different bosses. And looking back at the different jobs and positions, positions I held in the company, there are a few insights on, educa on education and work 
I believe the JP next students in the audience will need to be aware of as they contemplate and start their own careers. These, these uh, insights are, number one, your diploma is just a passport. Number two, never stop learning. Number three, do more than what is expected. And number four, be ready when the opportunity arrives. Your, your diploma, uh, or number one, your diploma is just a passport. It is proof that the company, it, it is the proof the company needs to assure itself that you at least have the conceptual knowledge or the capacity to understand the tasks and rules that will be assigned to you. Um, I'm sort of proof of that because I graduated as an industrial engineer, but entered Shell as an IT programmer who eventually made it to become CFO. My diploma got me through the door, but what happened after depended entirely on the next steps I took. Never stop learning. The world will not stand still after you graduate. Uh, as the world and society advances, new technologies are developed that impact the way we work. Whichever function you're in, whether you work in IT, finance, marketing, manufacturing, procurement, HR, or even as a member of the C-suite, there will always be a new process, new system, new way of working that will force you to adapt personally or as an enterprise or else. Take every opportunity to learn something new and related to the future you envision for yourself. Do more than what is expected means showing your potential. What you know is not enough. It's also about what you can achieve. You will only be given a big, bigger shoe when your feet outgrow the one you are currently wearing. And number four, lastly, be ready when the opportunity arrives. Being chosen for, for a promotion or a role in a high profile project is not about luck. Build your competence and suitability for the next role way before it becomes available and you will be chosen. Now, I've said all of this, but, but times have changed. What I did for my career my, may or may not be applicable today or for your own personal circumstances. With all the societal changes and techno technological advancements we are seeing, I think the most important thing to remember about education is to remain relevant. At this point, I wish to thank my other Phoenix colleagues for working hard to pass, uh, the, I mean, working hard the past few weeks to put this event together for our dear students. In particular, Mr. Tony Boy Onsiako for the, uh, our very dashing uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Mildred Vitankol, our J Phoenix committee chairperson, Mr. Benny Soliven, J Phoenix liaison trustee, EJ Hansen, and the rest of the J Phoenix committee and our indefatigable Phoenix secretariat. In closing, I hope you all found insight and enlightenment from today's forum and consider it part of your continuing education. Thank you all for attending and please continue to support the activities of J Phoenix. Okay, now the long wait is over. Again, to remind everyone, only students who registered and entered the webinar before 4 p.m. are eligible for today's raffle. We will now announce the lucky winners. We are raffling off cell phone load worth 300 to 500 pesos, and we will be giving 20 pieces of previously owned mobile tablets, which you can use for your online class. Now here are the 30 winners of 300 peso load. Uh, please take a picture, recognize your name, uh, and our secretariat will contact you um, for your prize. <clears throat> and then the winners of the 500 peso load will have 22 winners. Again, please take a screenshot or a picture and expect our secretariat to contact you again uh, for your prize. Our next raffle item will be 20 tablets. Uh, these are all previously owned Lenovo tablets, um, but the 20 winners are, uh, these are semi-used, uh, pre-loved, but still uh, very good. Uh, please take a screenshot and expect our secretariat to reach out to you uh, to claim your prize.
Congratulations to all the winners. Again, may I just remind all the winners to wait for the secretary to get in touch with you on how to claim your prize. But students, please don't go yet. We still have one Samsung tablet and one Huawei laptop computer to give away. You need to be present and we'll ask you to virtually raise your hand once we call your name. Uh, here we go. This is for the one winner of a Samsung tablet. And the winner is Christine de Assis. Can we ask Christine to please raise her hand so the secretariat can identify if you're here, if you're eligible, and they can coordinate so that you can receive your Samsung tablet. Ms. Christine is present. Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations. Christine, I recommended uh, an iPad, uh, not a Samsung. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'll take note of that, but uh, enjoy your Samsung. <laughs> uh, although there was a recommendation from our dashing moderator for an iPad. Uh, okay, congratulations, Christine. Now for the Huawei laptop computer. And the lucky winner is another Christine, Christine Hernandez. Lucky name today. Uh, Christine, please virtually raise your hand if you are here so we can identify you. She's present. Okay, congratulations to all of our winners. Congratulations. You will be receiving an email from the Phoenix Secretariat on how to claim your prize. Uh, please expect that. And thank you once again to everyone for attending. We would like to thank our sponsors for this year's conference, our partners, Davina Law, the LT Group of Companies, and Union Bank of the Philippines, our platinum sponsors, Avoitis Equity Ventures, Inc., Alliance Global Group, Inc., First Philippine Holdings Corporation, NOAA Business Applications, Robinson's Land Corporation, United Auctioneers, Inc., and Vista Land and Lifestyles, Inc., our diamond sponsors, All Day Supermarket, All Home, Ayala Land, Inc., Meralco, Andreas Takandong and Company, our knowledge partner, KPMG, RG, Manabat and Co., our gold sponsors, Acrolaw, Bank of the Philippine Islands, Certec Holdings, Philippines Corporation, Converge ICT Solutions, Inc., Navarro, Amper and Co., Deloitte Philippines, Philinvest Development Corporation, FTI Consulting, Inc., Metrobank, Mondenison Corporation, PNA Grant Thornton, RCBC, San Miguel Corporation, Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation, and SGV and Co. Our patron sponsors, BDO Unibank, Inc., Mega World, Philippine National Bank, Security Bank, Wilcon Depot, and East West Bank. Our official broadcast partner, ABS-CBN News Channel, and our print media partners, Business Mirror, Business World, The Manila Times, and Daily Tribune. Again, thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you again tomorrow for the last day of the Phoenix 53rd Annual Conference. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, EJ. Uh, thank you, Jang. Thank you, Madam Mildred. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Dash. Thank you very much. Thank you.